thanks for tuning in to the Oxygen Alliance YouTube channel where we share the concentrated talk virtual meeting hosted every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. In the talk, we discuss different aspects of oxygen concentrate assessment, use and maintenance. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications bell. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Concentrator Talk call brought to you by the Oxygen Alliance. Uh, so this is our final call of the year and I'm very pleased to be hosting the call today. I'm joined by my colleague Cynthia Chukomuni along with our usual technicians from Open O2 and Sunrise. On the technicians panel today, we have Paulina Mohosho and Kowinda Singh, which are our technicians from Sunrise. And we have Chimwemwe TAC, Daphne Magela, uh, Linda Mishoni, and Fatsani Tamandikani, who are our technicians from OpenO2. Oh, and uh, Eunice Msiska. Uh, so in case you're joining us for the first time, the Concentrator Talk is a virtual meeting that the Oxygen Alliance hosts every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. And here we discuss the different aspects of uh, concentrator use, uh, assessment, and maintenance. So if you have any issues with your machines, uh, then you can always contact us uh, through our email address, info at oxygenalliance.org. And our technicians are always happy to help. So please uh, send those issues through and we'll do our best to help you out with them. Uh, during the call, we normally have a topic of interest. And uh, some few weeks ago, we started a topic on uh, troubleshooting and fixing common oxygen uh, concentrator problems. So today we'll be presenting the final part of that series. So please stay on the call and don't miss that one. So we also have pause at the end of some of the questions and uh, please attend to them when they pop up because they help us to get feedback from the audience. And uh, if you have any questions during the call, you are also encouraged to ask them. You can always raise your hands and then uh, one of our technicians will respond to whatever questions you might have. We also encourage you to share with us your email addresses as this will help us to send out this to you and remind us of our next concentrator talk course. So today we'll be taking a slightly different approach. So we have questions for our technicians, but we, all, we are also happy to listen to responses from our audience today. So please, if you get a question for the audience, uh, if you know the answer, you can always raise your hand or come off mute and then respond. All right, so we'll now jump on to our questions for today. And our first question says, hello, I am a biomedical technician at a certain private clinic in Zambia. I was working on a care companion oxygen concentrator and the check valve that connect one sieve to the product tank got broken. So I wanted to use the concentrator without the check valve. Unfortunately, the purity drops. Is the removal of the valve the cause of the drop in oxygen purity? So I'm going to ask one of our uh, technicians, either from Open O2 or Sunrise, to respond to this one. So you can just raise your hand and I'll just pick whoever is fastest on that. Okay, I see we have a hand from Fatsani. Go ahead, Fatsani. All right, thank you, Ma. I think I can take this one. So basically, in oxygen concentrators, you find uh, two sieve beds that contain molecular sieve that are responsible for the adsorption of nitrogen from the ambient air. So when uh, one sieve bed is being fed with air for the adsorption process, uh, the other sieve bed uh, depressurizes, thereby releasing the nitrogen to the atmosphere. So the sieve bed that has just been, uh, that has just released the nitrogen, it still remains with some residual nitrogen. So with the help of orifices, a small portion of this oxygen exiting one sieve bed is routed back to the other sieve bed during the process called purging. And the remainder of the oxygen gas is then directed to the check valve uh, it's directed to the product tank through the check valve that you are talking about. So here, the oxygen is stored before being delivered to the patient. The uh, function of this valve is just to prevent backflow of oxygen from the product tank, 
back into the same page. So let's change this far. I have a question for the audience. Uh, anyone in the audience can take this question. So uh, having a screen, uh, the function will know the check valve between the sieve bed and the product tank. What do you think will be the result if this check valve is broken and the backflow of oxygen from the product tank to the sieve bed is not prevented? So anyone in the audience can raise their hand and answer this question. Anyone, you can always come off mute or you can just type it in the chat and then I'll read it out. All right, I'll jump in. All right, go ahead. Sure. So if these valves are blocking or they are no, not there, then the uh, more oxygen will be able to flow back to the safe beds. The product tank will not be holding enough oxygen resulting in low oxygen purity. Um, back to you, Fatsani. Thank you, Shumwemwe. That is very correct. So as Shumwemwe has already explained, uh, you always have to make sure that your oxygen concentrator is operating with the check valves in place. If you don't have the check valves, so what you have are broken check valves, I would advise that you do not use that oxygen concentrator until you order some check valves from the internet or you can scavenge from dead concentrators. And uh, if you have uh, if you have found a check valve, you need to make sure that there's no leakage after replacing the check valve because leakages might cause a drop in oxygen purity. So you can check for these leakages by just applying uh, survey water on those joints between the tubings and the check valve. So thank you. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Fatsani, for that, and Timuimu for your response. Uh, indeed, that is true. Check valves are very important in oxygen concentrators. I remember one time I was working on a certain machine, and we had an issue of low purity. We serviced the compressor, we replaced the zeolite, but then nothing seemed to be improving. But uh, upon troubleshooting further, we then came to realize that one of the check valves on one of the sieve beds uh, had the diaphragm damage, so it was just allowing air through both ways. So after we replaced the check valve, we discovered that the constant, the purity now went up to 95.6. So check valves are very important, and we always need to have them in our devices in order for them to perform highly. All right, uh, so if we have any further questions or comments from the audience, we can always make those comments. Okay, seems we don't have any questions. So I'll jump on to our next question and it reads, Hi, I was about, we have about five concentrators in our workshop whose compressors need servicing. Currently, we have run out of compressor service kits. Is it possible to reuse the old compressor service kits? So I'm going to ask one of our technicians to respond to this one. So you can just raise your hands and uh, respond. Right, we have a hand from Eunice. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much. So to answer your question, yes, it is possible to use old compressor service kits. And to be specific, specific the cylinder sleeves are the ones that can be reused and not the piston caps. This is because in most cases, the piston caps tend to be extremely worn out and lose the capacity to form an airtight seal in the cylinder sleeves, which in turn results in reduced compressor output pressure. The cylinder sleeves of different compressor models have different height and diameter. Therefore, to reuse old sleeves will not only depend on the extent of wear and tear of the internal lining of the sleeves. It will also depend on the compressor model. For example, the compressor model such as ZW148-2 and Thomas 2669 have seen the sleeves with a height larger than the travel distance for the piston, which gives us the advantage to use the cylinder, to reuse the cylinder sleeves of these compressor models. The sleeves in ZW148-2 compressor only wear out for a quarter of the height and about half of the sleeves in Thomas 669 um, they, wear up, they wear out about a quarter of the, half of the height and about 
half of the sleeves in Thomas six two six six nine compressor gets worn out. So I actually know an expert right here on the call at reusing cylinder sleeves. I've seen her do it and get a good performance from the compressor. So I'll ask her to explain the procedure she uses and she should review herself. <laughs> What an introduction. Okay, let me get to it. Uh, the following are the procedures that you can do uh, to reuse the cylinder sleeves. Firstly, you have to gently clean the worn out part of the sleeves using a fine sandpaper. In order to make the cleaning easy, you can dip the sandpaper in soapy water, then use a cloth to wipe and dry the sleeves once you have finished the cleaning. To put, the, to put back the sleeves into the compressor, you should turn the sleeves upside down so that the worn out portion uh, is on the bottom side and the damaged portion is on the upper side. You should take note that you can only use the sleeves if they are uh, not badly worn out and if at the moment you do not have spare piston caps for, the, for that particular compressor uh, you are working on, I recommend that you wait until the new uh, compressor service kits are purchased for you to service the compressors. So back to you, Eunice. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so those are the steps to follow when you're trying to reuse your old cylinder streams. I'm sure by doing that, your compressor can function very well. So as you can see in the graphic, that's the cylinder sleeve for an old 2669 compressor cylinder sleeve. Thank you very much and back to you, Mau. Thank you very much, Eunice and Linda for that response. I'm sure the audience has uh, learned a thing or two from there. And uh, in case we face a similar issue where we need to service a compressor, but then we don't have the cylinder sleeves or we don't have the right height cylinder sleeves, now we know what to do. If we follow this, I'm sure we will be able to get our device up and running again. And uh, if you are still facing further issues, you can always reach back to us and then we'll suggest uh, different solutions for you to try out. All right. So we have a poll at the end of this question. So I am going to launch that poll. So the poll uh, reads, have you ever reused compressor cylinder sleeves before? So this is just for us to know uh, how many people have ever used, uh, have ever done this before, because we normally do this if we encounter a concentrator whose sleeves are not amongst our inventory. Okay, this is interesting. Looking at the votes, it seems most of us uh, have done this before, but then we still have a, a smaller number of some of us who have never done this before. So I'm sure you now know what to do and how to do it. And uh, as Eunice said, we have an expert in this. So if you have uh, any issues, you can always contact us and then I'm sure Linda will help you out with how to get around with it. All right, so I'm going to end our poll now and we'll jump on to our next question, which reads, Hello, I am working as a procurement officer at a certain hospital. We are planning to purchase oxygen concentrators and I would like to know some of the accessories that are required for concentrators. So I'm going to ask one of our technicians to respond to this one. Okay, Kowinda, go ahead. Thank you, Mavi. So, oxygen concentrator accessories are important for an oxygen concentrator and for oxygen therapy. They help prolong the concentrator's lifespan and with delivery of oxygen to patients. Uh, depending upon the model, some oxygen concentrators come with accessories while others do not. So I would advise you to research and find out if the model you are purchasing comes with accessories. If it does not, you can purchase the accessories separately. 
I will list some of the important accessories to help with uh, with your procurement process, and will also explain their purposes. So, an oxygen concentrator requires accessories such as humidifier bottles, nasal cannulas, oxygen masks, patient outlet tubing connector, oxygen analyzers, and filters. It can be cabinet or the HEPA filter. So I will start with the humidifier bottle. It is uh, it is used to moisturize oxygen, uh, thereby decreasing dryness during oxygen delivery to the patient. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Starting from the humidifier bottle, it is uh, used to moisture, uh, moisturize oxygen, thereby decreasing dryness during oxygen delivery to the patient. It provides comfort to the patient and prevents drying of the nose, mouth, lungs and respiratory membranes. It is attached to the patient's outlet fitting of the concentrator and the oxygen passes through the distilled water in the humidifier bottle before it gets to the patient. So next is the nasal cannula and mask as you can see in the presentation. So oxygen concentrators require devices that enable the flow of oxygen from the concentrator to the patient. So this is when laser cannulas and masks come in handy. They are used to deliver oxygen to the hypoxic patients. So nasal cannulas are flexible tubes placed under the nose. The tube has two nasal prongs that go inside the nostrils and smaller tubing to hook around the ears and hold the nasal cannula in place. So oxygen masks cover the mouth and nose and are held in place using an elastic band that wraps around the back of the head. So as we can see in both the cannula and the mask fit it in the presentation. So patient outlet tubing connector, also known as Christmas tree adapter. So this is a connector that is used to connect the nasal cannula or face mask tubing to the concentrator outlet port if the humidifier bottle is not used. So sometimes, especially when oxygen is being delivered to the patient at low flow rates or there is a need to use a flow splitter, a humidifier bottle is not connected to the patient outlet fitting on the concentrator. In these cases, to deliver oxygen therapy to the patient, there is a need for a device that can enable the connection of the tubing to the fit fitting on the concentrator. So the Christmas tree adapter has a wide base with threads and is screwed onto the concentrator patient outlet fitting to be able to use oxygen delivery accessories. Uh, oxygen analyzer. So this is a tool for measuring oxygen concentrator uh, level produced by the oxygen concentrator. So if the hospital or workshop does not have one, this is an important tool. Uh, for my, this is an important tool to buy. So the World Health Organization (WHO) recommends that an oxygen concentrator must be cap capable of delivering a oxygen flow at a concentration of oxygen greater than 82 percent. So for the staff to ensure the oxygen concentrators are delivering oxygen at the recommended concentration, so need they they need an analyzer to check the purity and maintain the concentration if it need be uh, this is the only way they can check otherwise they might use the concentrator while it is giving out low concentrations in which case which is not helpful to the patients so oxygen concentrator filters protect the concentrator and the patient from dust and the other inhalable particles and risk of infection the concentrator has different filters placed in different locations and this includes gross particle filters intake filters 
bacteria filters at the outlet. Uh, this usually comes with the concentrator, but it is good to have spares because it is not advisable to use concentrators without filters, and the filters are regularly uh, regularly replaced during the maintenance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kowinda, for that response. Uh, that was well detailed. I'm sure now you know what accessories you need to have in your inventory. And if you are missing any of uh, the accessories that he has just explained, uh, please make sure that you order them so that your inventory is well stocked. And uh, in case you need any of the accessories, you will have uh, something readily available. So if we have any questions from the audience or comments from the other technicians, we are free to make those comments. Okay, looks like we don't have any comments. So we'll now be jumping on to our next question, which reads, Hi, I am working on a counter oxygen concentrator, which has been staying idle for some time in the workshop. I am unable to repair the concentrator because the tubing which has the orifices and is connected between the two sieve beds was misplaced and I cannot find it. Is it okay if I replace the missing pipe with a tubing which does not have orifices inside? So as usual, I'm going to ask one of our uh, technicians to respond to this one. So just raise your hand and uh, come off mute, please. Okay, Linda, you have your hands. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, one of the important phases in the production of oxygen using the pressure swing adsorption process is the paging phase. When a seedbed has been depressurized in a, in a concentrator, there is a residual uh, nitrogen which remains in the seedbed. Therefore, in order to completely cleanse the seedbed, a certain amount of concentrated oxygen is allowed to flow from the pressurized seedbed into the depressurized seedbed to flush out any residual nitrogen. This process is what is known as the paging. And during this process, if the oxygen is left to flow freely from the pressurized seedbed to the depressurized seedbed, there will be a drop in the oxygen concentration. Uh, coming out from uh, that is at the patient outlet port. Uh, this is because more oxygen will be used for the paging process than the oxygen which is flowing into the product tank. Therefore, to prevent this from occurring, oxygen concentrators have orifices installed in a tubing between the two seed beds. These orifices have a small size diameter hole which allows a very small amount of oxygen to flow from one seedbed to the other during the paging phase. As such, it is not a good idea to replace this tubing with another tubing with no orifice in it. So I would like to hear from my colleagues what you would do in this situation or what recommendation you would give to solve this problem. It's not like I don't have an idea, but you know, teamwork makes the dream work. Chimwemwe, you have a hand. Go ahead. Indeed, Linda, teamwork makes the dream work. Well, my recommendation would be that if you have another kind of oxygen concentrator, you can uh, scavenge pass from. You can get the tubing with the orifices from that concentrator to replace with the missing one. Yeah, so back to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Jimwemi. That's true. Uh, so as we can see in the graphics, uh, the image on the left just shows the tubing with orifices. That is for the J5 oxygen concentrator. And the image on the right, uh, the tubing with the black clip has an orifice, and that is for the devil piece 5 to 5. So back to you, Maui. Thank you very much, Linda, for that response. Uh, that was well detailed. And uh, yeah, uh, indeed, just like the check valve, the orifice is very important. So we always need to make sure that we have one of those in our machines if it was designed to take one. Uh, we have two polls at the end of this question, so I am going to launch both of them at once, and uh, please respond to them. 
So the first one reads, have you ever replaced the tubing containing orifices with another one without the orifices? And the second one is a follow-up, which says, uh, which if you respond yes on the first one, then we are just interested to know what happened to the oxygen concentrator, to the concentration of the concentrator after you removed it. So I'm going to leave it open for a few minutes and then we look at their responses. Okay, looks like uh, a majority of us have uh, have ever have never replaced the tube with one that doesn't have before so i'm guessing we know what happens when uh when we replace uh, a tube without an orifice so the purity will drop as linda has explained and on our follow-up question uh most of us answer that the purity drops so i'm sure we all know what happens when the or when you replace a pipe that is meant to have an orifice, but then you use one that doesn't. So please always make sure that when you are fixing your machine, if you have a pipe that contains an orifice, when you are cleaning the pipes, or if for some reason you need to replace the pipe, make sure that you replace it, you replace it with a pipe that also has an orifice inside of it. So I'm going to close our polls and we will now jump on to our next question, which reads, Hello, I'm a biomedical technician working at a private hospital in Karonga district. And most of our oxygen concentrators do not have cabinet filters. We use cotton wool instead of uh, the normal filters. But when we test the purity, it does not go as high as 95.6. And with time, the purity drops. Can the cotton wool be the cause of the drop in oxygen purity? And what can I do to rectify this problem? So I'm going to ask one of our technicians to respond to this one. OK, we have a hand from Eunice. Go ahead, Eunice. All right, thank you very much, Maui. So every oxygen considerator that you come across will always have filters. And these filters aid in the filtering of the ambient air that is drawn into the concentrator by the compressor. The air is then directed to the sieve beds where nitrogen is absorbed. And the remaining gas, which is oxygen, passes through a bacteria filter then goes to the patient outlet. There are three major filters that you'll find in an oxygen concentrator. The first one is the cabinet filter, the one that you are talking about, also known as the gross particle filter. The second one is the fine particle filter, in, I mean fine particle intake filter, and this one is internal to the machine. And the third filter is the bacteria filter. So all these filters are equally important for a high efficiency of the oxygen concentrators. The gross particle filter is made of pores that sieve the large particles and other impurities before the ambient air enters the oxygen concentrator. The pores are calculated and correctly designed to trap the impurities. The filters are made by randomly arranging the polypropylene or fiberglass fibers, and the pores are of the range between 0 0.5 and 0 micrometers. So basic filters are typically built using borosilicate, glass fibers, Plastic fibers, also known as polypropylene, or fiberglass. So if you're using fiberglass, you need to be very, very careful because if it uh, gets into air, it can be very harmful to your health. So gross particle filters used in oxygen concentrators are made of plastic fibers, and these mechanically traps large dust particles and other impurities on the filter media as air passes through it. So if you look close at the gross particle filters that come with uh, the oxygen concentrators, you will see that they are spongy. As such, they allow air to pass through easily. On the other hand, cotton wool is not as porous as the gross particle filters which are used in oxygen concentrators. Therefore, using cotton wool instead of a gross particle filter will have an impact on the performance of the concentrator. 
This is so because the closely packed pores on the cotton wool will be restricting the airflow into the unit, thereby reducing the amount of air being compressed by the compressor. And also, because of the compacted pores, cotton wool can easily become clogged by debris, thereby completely blocking the airflow into the unit. This in turn will affect the concentration of the oxygen since there will not be enough pressure built up for the nitrogen absorption process in the seedbeds. In addition, cotton wool has a tendency of shading off. So as the compressor is pulling in air from the environment, there's a high possibility that the, the, hypo, there's a high possibility that the cotton wool may be drawn into the unit as well. This may cause an obstruction in the air pathway, which can also affect the concentrator performance. So Fatal and I have actually come across a situation like this in the field. I hope he remembers. Oh, and I hope you don't think I'm throwing you under the bus, but if you, can, if you could share the experience with the audience or offer any, ad, any advice, it is very welcome. So Fatani, if you can share anything, you can do that. Uh, thank you, Eunice, for giving me this chance. Yeah, I do remember coming across this situation in one of the district hospitals that we visited a couple of months ago. So as Eunice has already pointed out, cotton wool restricts the flow of air into the concentrator. So my, my, my recommendation would be that you purchase new gross particle filters or scavenge from dead concentrators. In case that you have an agent need to use the concentrators, for example, in cases of emergencies, then you can use a piece of gauze while waiting for the filters to be purchased. Uh, when you come across this situation, what we did was that uh, we used a gauze bandage as a gross particle filter. So we folded it twice, uh, was it? Yeah, twice or thrice, so that there is uh, there are no large pores which will allow the large dust particles to pass freely while uh, restricting airflow. Then you can use salt tape to attach the gauze to the cup of the concentrator and make sure that the gauze is changed frequently and you need to know that the use of gauze should not be a permanent solution. So, uh, in whatever you do, you need to have uh, those particle filters purchased. You can just use uh, the gauze temporarily. So this worked for us and the period of the concentrator was not affected. So back to you, Eunice. So yeah, that's what we did. And I'm sure if you can follow what we also did in the field, I'm sure your oxygen considerer can be working properly. So thank you very much, Maui. Back to you. Thank you very much, Eunice and Fatsani for sharing your experience with us. I'm sure the audience has picked up a thing or two from there. And now if they face a similar issue, they know how to get around it. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that we are always using the right uh, components on the machine, be it the valves, the orifices, even the filters. You need to make sure that you have the right sized filters because they are placed there for a very specific reason. So if you try to use a different one, then it becomes a problem. And as Fatsani said, if you opt to use the gauze bandage, please use it as a temporary solution as you try to source the... Uh, actual filter that was designed to go on your machine. So don't take it as a permanent solution, but use it as a temporary fix as you try and source the right filter. All right, so reaching this far, we'll take a slight diversion from our questions and we'll jump onto our topic of interest. And as I explained at the beginning, today we'll be finalizing the topic that we started a couple of weeks ago on troubleshooting and fixing common problems of uh, on oxygen concentrators. So Daphne is going to take us through that explanation. Over to you, Daphne. Um, all right. Thank you, Maui. So as Maui has said, today we'll be finishing up on troubleshooting common problems in oxygen concentrators. And I'll be taking you through power issues and plant preventative maintenance, also known as PBM. So, um, I'm starting with power issues. Since oxygen concentrators are electrical devices, they may experience power problems that prevent them from performing as intended. Oxygen concentrators frequently experience power-related issues such as blown fuses, 
effective compressor capacitors, effective switches, those connections, and low or high voltages. I'm going to start with explaining um, about the blown out fuse. Oxygen. Daphne, you are breaking up. I don't know if it's an issue on my side or every, everyone is having a similar issue. I can't get you clearly. Linda, are you able to hear Daphne? No. Daphne, I think we lost you. We have lost you there. I not right. Yeah, we lost you for a moment. We couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. So maybe you can just uh, start over so that we get the part that we missed. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just start over with the blown out fuse. In oxygen concentrators, this is I use as a weak point that will melt and stop the flow of electricity in the case of issues of poor um, power quality, such as outages, over voltages, voltage surges, and voltage spikes that could damage the concentrator's electric components. For oxygen concentrators, such as the group is 515 and 525, the fuse is located on the PCB. While for Foley and J5, the fuse is located just above the power cable connector on the back of the concentrator. If there is no power, please check the fuse's condition. And this can be done using a multimeter. Remove the fuse from the concentrator, set the multimeter on continuity mode, and then put one lead on each end of the fuse. If a beeping sound is produced, the fuse is okay. If not, the fuse is damaged. Um, please replace it with a new fuse of the same power rating. Next, I'll talk about a defective compressor capacitor. The capacitor starts the compressor and keeps it running. So if the compressor cannot start or periodically stop running, the capacitor may be faulty and require replacement. To replace the capacitor, turn off the concentrator and disconnect the power cord. Remove the side and lower front panels and locate the compressor capacitor. So as we can see from the images, in the Jabu is 525, um, the capacitor is found just beneath um, where you connect the power cable, and in the air step, it's found on top of the compressor and it's mounted with the cable tie. So once you locate the compressor capacitor, just connect the two leads to the capacitor and slide the capacitor out of the tie wrap holding it in place. Use the capacitance meter to test the integrity of the capacitor so as to verify that the capacitor is indeed defective. To install the new capacitor, connect the leads and slide the capacitor into the tie wrap holding it in place. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about a 40 switch. The power switch has a metal contact, which due to overuse or other reasons may get bent and have a bent and have a permanent contact or opening. This affects the switch's operation in such a way that even when the switch is set to zero, the machine may still be powered if the metal contact remains in the contact position. Check the functionality of the power switch. So make sure that the unit is unplugged from the wall outlet, remove the front and back cabinets, note the position of the wires and switch before removing the wires from the switch terminals. While squeezing the locking tabs on the sides of the switch, push the switch out. Set the switch pattern to off and use the multimeter to check for continuity. If there is continuity while the switch is in the off position, then the switch is faulty. And please um, replace the switch. Next, I'm going to talk about loose connections. Loose connections in an electric circuit may adversely affect the signal transmission efficiency, particularly for electric components. Look for any loose connections on electric components such as the circuit board and the compressor fan, solenoid rotary valve, and power cable. You can use a multimeter to test the continuity when looking for those connections. The testing should start from the power cable. 
Check the cable for continuity and also check if there is a visible discrimination at the cable connector. If there is no problem with the cable, then open the concentrator to check for loose connections with the switch, the circuit board, fan, solenoid or rotary valve, and compressor. These connections on the oxygen sensor cause a continuous beeping of the alarm. So if this is happening, check for continuity of the traces that go from the oxygen sensor to the circuit board and so that the loose connections are together. Lastly, I'm going to talk about low or high voltage. Low voltage outputs, such as voltage sets, affects the performance of oxygen concentrators. With low voltage output, the supply voltage is low compared to the concentrator's operating voltage, which causes overheating of the motor due to the inefficient running of the motor. High voltage outputs, such as voltage stretches, voltage spikes, over voltage and outages, and, out, and outages sorry, cause oxygen concentrators to draw too much power, which can lead to damage to the microcontroller, um, circuit boards, and compressor, which eventually leads to the permanent damage of oxygen concentrators. Power protective measures, such as voltage regulators and voltage stabilizers, can be used with an oxygen concentrator to correct the supply voltage to the needed voltage by the oxygen concentrator. Next, um, and our final topic under this topic of interest, I'm going to talk about plant preventative maintenance, um, also known as PVM. There are different types of maintenance carried out when working on medical equipment, such as oxygen concentrators. These are corrective and preventative maintenance. Corrective maintenance is the um, maintenance that is performed in order to identify and repair a fault so that the malfunctioning oxygen concentrator can be put back to proper operational conditions. While preventative maintenance is the inspection, adjustment, and replacement of parts per performed in order to prevent faults from occurring. It also helps to identify problems that would otherwise be neglected until they develop into bigger problems. Plant preventative maintenance involves maintenance activities that are stated ahead of time, and they're also carried out on a regular basis. Some of the um, activities that are carried out during the PPM include um, replacing of filters. So oxygen concentrators have numerous filters positioned in various places. These include intake filters, cabinet filters, and bacteria filters. They need to be changed and cleaned as frequently as recommended by the manufacturer in order to protect the compressor and prolong the concentrator's lifespan. The cabinet filter's function is to prevent large particles such as dust, lint, and other debris from entering the concentrator as air is drawn in. It needs to be cleaned frequently because it is often clogged with dust and large particles. The cabinet filter can be washed, air dried, and then placed back onto the concentrator. If during PPM it is found that the concentrator is being used without a cabinet filter, um, a piece of gauze, just like I'm suggested, can be used until a replacement filter is found. And this piece of course is not a permanent solution as said, but if you're going to use it for let's say two weeks and while waiting for your um, gross particle filter to arrive, it should be noted that the piece of course must be replaced um, weekly. So all particles that are not caught by the cabinet filter are trapped by the intake filter. How frequently the intake filter needs maintenance is usually determined by the amount of use and environment in which it is used. Um, the intake filter is more often changed in um, just the environment. And since the majority of intake filters are sealed, like you can see on the image, these, video, these filters are usually replaced. Next, um, the bacteria filter. So the bacteria filter is used to protect patients from viruses and bacteria. The bacteria filter is rarely damaged, and the most frequent cause of damage is contamination when water from the humidifier bottle travels back into the concentrator and issues the bacteria filter. Oxygen concentrator manuals also detail how often a bacteria filter should be changed. For example, the Tegubis 515 service manual states that the bacteria filter must be changed every two years for 17,520 hours. Next, um, the next activity I'm going to talk about that is carried out during PPM is checking alarm system battery, checking the alarm system battery. So the power alarm in some concentrator models is powered by a 9 volt battery. When the concentrator is turned on but not connected to power, or when the power is abruptly interrupted, this alarm is set off. 
So please replace the nine volt battery when necessary. The next activity we carried out during PPM is checking oxygen concentration and outlet pressure. It is very important to carry out routine maintenance checks on oxygen concentration levels using an oxygen analyzer. During these checks, it is verified whether the oxygen concentration is within the recommended range. This is very important for the patient in order to ensure that they are always provided oxygen at therapeutic levels. The patient outlet pressure is also measured, and this can be done using an analyzer or a pressure gauge. Performance outside normal ranges suggests that internal components may need repairing or re replacement. Another activity we carried out during PPM is screening and disinfection. The oxygen concentrator must routinely be cleaned. This must be done when it is disconnected from the power source. The outside of the concentrator can be wiped with a damp cloth and mild detergents. Dust inside the concentrator can be removed using a blower. A blower is also used to remove dust in places where a damp cloth cannot reach. The humidifier bottle must also be cleaned and disinfected thoroughly on a weekly basis and with the food water changed every day and between patients. The last uh, activity I'm going to talk about is um, checking top plugs. So it is important to check if the top plugs being used are compatible with the power outlets of the clinical facility and the country where the, co where the oxygen concentrator is being used. Some concentrators are donated to hospitals, and the result may have electrical plugs that are not suitable for the country. These should be replaced. There are other times where the top plug has a fault, such as the branch fuse, and they need to be replaced. There are also scenarios where the typical staff removed the top plug because it was not compatible with the power outlet and just connect the wires directly to the outlet, which is very dangerous. And this can only be identified in and rectified during the PPM. Thank you so much, Mark. Back to you. Thank you very much, Daphne, for uh, that uh, last part of our topic that we started. And uh, I'm sure we now have a complete say. So if you happen to have missed uh, our previous uh, videos, then you can find them on our YouTube channel, or if you just go on our website under Topic of Interest, they are nicely arranged there. So you will be able to follow through all the two previous parts that we presented. And if we have any questions for Daphne on what she has just presented to us, we are free to ask or make any comments if we have any. Okay, no questions or comments. So we'll be jumping back to our questions. And our next question reads, hello, I'm a biomedical technician working with a certain organization. We visit hospitals to fix oxygen concentrators and also train the technicians on how to fix oxygen concentrators. One technician asked me a question that I failed to answer. So I thought you might help. The question was, is it a must to have check valves in an oxygen concentrator? Because he said he had seen some concentrators like the J5, which do not have the check valve. So I'm going to ask one of our technicians to raise their hand and respond to this question. Okay, we have a hand from Fatsani. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mark. So to answer this question, I check valve which is sometimes known as a one-way valve, is a valve that allows fluids such as air and water to flow in one direction. So these valves are usually found or placed after the seabed and just before the patient outlet in an oxygen concentrator. So in the graphic, uh, you have the first one, you have a check valve that is between the seabed and the product tank. And the second picture you have a check valve that is connected between the outlet of the oxygen concentrator and the bacterial filter and then to the outlet of the flow meter. So as already mentioned, uh, these valves allow air to flow in one direction, meaning they, pre uh, they prevent the flow of air. And this is very useful for different scenarios in the oxygen concentrator. So a check valve is placed after the sieve bed in order to prevent the oxygen produced by the sieve bed from flowing back from the product tank into the seabed again. 
And when delivering oxygen to the patient, most times the humidifier bottle is used to moisten the air breathed in by the patient. And when the oxygen concentrator is switched off, there is a back pressure that allows water to flow from the humidifier bottle into the oxygen concentrator. And uh, if the concentrator has a check valve, this water will not go any further into the concentrator because the water is moving in the opposite direction. So, however, if the concentrator does not have a final check valve, the water then might go into the product tank and can over time accumulate and even enter the sieve beds and reach the rotary or solenoid valves. So this can affect the oxygen purity. If water reaches the sieve beds, they become uh, the molecular sieves you right inside the sieve beds, they are uh, contaminated and this affects their adsorption ability. Therefore, leading to low oxygen purity. So, uh, uh, my friend Linda has already said that teamwork makes a teamwork. So I'd like also to ask my colleagues to share their experiences with check valves and what they have learned from those experiences. So, anyone in the audience? So I've mm -hmm. actually come across a situation where the concentrator didn't have a check valve before the patient outlet. We were assessing considerators in the wards and found a considerator at 21 percent. We pulled it from the wards and opened it. We found that the water had gone all the way to the seed beds and the zero it was weighed in the lumpy and the filters were damaged. So it is advised to add check valves in your oxygen concentrator in order to prevent backflow of oxygen in the seed beds and backflow of water into the concentrator. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Back to you, Fatsan. All right, thank you, Eunice, for adding to what I've already said. So uh, check valves are very important, especially the check valve between the sieve bed and the product tank. You have to make sure that that check valve is always there. Uh, for the check valve that is connected between the outlet and the outlet or the flow meter, some concentrators, for example, the J5, do not have that check valve. But uh, they have the check valve between the product tank and the sieve bed because the water, if there's an emission of water in the product tank, this water can go to the sieve beds and water can damage uh, or decrease the efficiency of zeolite inside the sieve bed. So you need to make sure that there is a check valve between the product tank and the sieve bed. So thank you. Uh, back to you, Mal. Thank you very much, Fatsani, for that question. Uh, for that response, sorry, and I'm sure the audience has uh, picked up a thing or two from that. And if they face a similar issue, should be able to get around your problem. So we have a poll at the end of this question. So I am going to launch that poll. And uh, the poll reads, have you ever found a concentrator whose sieve beds were contaminated by water from the humidifier bottle? So I'm going to leave this one open and then uh, people can vote. So I personally have actually uh, experienced this before. We're working on a concentrator that didn't have a check valve and uh, we serviced the compressor, changed the zeolite in the sieve bed, but we, rea we realized that uh, there was water in the sieve bed. And uh, when we tried to uh, replace the zeolite, we thought of uh, checking in the product tank before we actually run the concentrate and we realized that it actually had water and this was caused because it did not have that check valve on the patient's outlet. So it's always important to have that one. And uh, our votes are in and looking at the votes, most of us have uh, actually experienced this with a few people saying that they have not uh, had this encounter before. So I'm sure now, if you ever happen to face a similar situation, you know how to go about it. So looking at our time, uh, it's uh, almost uh, three o'clock Central African time. And this now brings us to the end of our call today. And I would like to thank you all for joining us for the call. It was really amazing. And as I said at the beginning of the call, this is our final call of the year, and uh, 
we are going to break for our Christmas holidays and we'll be back in January. Uh, it has been a wonderful journey where we have uh, shared a lot of information that we have managed to pick up, to pick up. And uh, we have also learned from our audience as well. For those of you, as, uh, for those of us that were interactive during the course, so we hope to see you again next year. And uh, in case uh, you happen to have missed most of our calls, we have all of them recorded and they are actually posted on our YouTube channel, which is also linked to our website. So if you go on our YouTube channel or our website, you'll be able to access all the concentrated talk calls that we have done this year so far. So reaching this far, I would like to thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll meet you again next year when we resume our normal concentrator talk course. So I wish you all happy holidays and we'll see you again in January. Goodbye.